All right, let's go ahead and start here. So, this is our fourth class in our Summer Sunday School series, and we're focused on the events that took place in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. So here's three housekeeping points to begin that I just want you to be really clear on. Number one, let's just remember, the 16th century is the 1500s. That's going to get you every time, Mike. Okay? So the 1500s are the 16th century. Clear as mud. I don't know. Okay, you can figure it out. Uh, number two, would you hear me use the word papal, P-A-P-A-L? That simply means anything that pertains to the pope or his office or authority. So when I describe a papal decree, it's a decree that's made by the pope. Or when we talk about a, a, a papal, um, uh, just any aspect of the papacy, that's the office of the pope. Keep that in mind. And number three, we're going to reference some German names and, and cities today, and you're going to see them spelled with W's, and I'm going to pronounce them with a V sound. That's not a mistake, I promise. You don't have to correct me for that. So when we get to what looks like Wittenberg and Wartburg and Worms, it's going to be Wittenberg and Wartburg and Worms. And I'm not having a mental breakdown, I promise. That's actually how you're supposed to pronounce them, okay? Papacy, W's are V's today, and the 1500s are the 16th century. So everything is upside down to begin. I want to make a very clear distinction at the beginning of this lesson. This is not the Martin Luther that we're talking about. <laughs> Be honest, have you ever made this mistake? Somebody's talking to you about Martin Luther, and you had in your head the American, there's one, honesty, Dave, I appreciate that. You were thinking of the American civil rights leader of the 1960s, when in fact they were talking about the German theologian of the 1500s. So this is not our guy. This is our Martin Luther that we're studying in class. And as you can see, he's born in the 15th century, late 15th century, and he lives on and ministers into the, the mid-16th century. So we left the story off last week with Pastor Jeff, where Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the castle uh, church door of Wittenberg. This happened on October 31st, 1517, and Martin Luther was 34 years old, just for a little context as we pick up today. Quick side note, that is a great replacement for Halloween. October 31st is Reformation Day. So if you don't want to trick or treat, you don't want to celebrate Halloween, uh, go out and have a, a Martin Luther 95 Theses party instead. So that's a nice little encouragement. You could even get the haircuts, like the Friar haircut and all that, the Martin Luther haircut. Can anybody tell me in one or two sentences what the 95 Theses were about? We touched on them last week. Can anybody just give me a quick summary what were the 95 Theses focused on? Marissa, yeah. So he was criticizing Roman Catholic theology. Do you remember the specific point that he was criticizing? Indulgences, there you go. So let's just remember some of this. Indulgences were pardons issued by the church that supposedly forgave a portion of a person's sin debt. So in exchange for some service done for the church, the Pope could issue an indulgence and you would have some of your sin debt removed. Or they could be sold for money. We saw that last week with Johann Tetzel. He was selling indulgences. And it was specifically the abuse of indulgences. So very interestingly enough, at the beginning of this whole story, Martin Luther didn't protest against indulgences themselves. Initially, it was just the abuse of indulgences that offended him. Later on, he does criticize the official theology, questions the whole idea of an indulgence, and eventually he abandons the whole concept altogether. But initially, it was the abuse. So it would be a mistake for us to think that on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther woke up and said, you know what, I'm done with Rome and I'm done with the Pope, I'm starting my own church. That's not how the Reformation unfolded. In fact, initially, Luther did not want to break away from Rome. He wanted to reform Rome. And it took him a while to break away from his allegiance to the Pope. So the story of Luther's conversion, if you will, is actually more of a gradual process that plays out over the course of several months and several debates that take place. You're going to see this guy is debating all the time. Luther loved to debate. The, the first of those debates that we're going to look at this morning took place in 1518. 
As you can imagine, Rome is not happy with the 95 Theses. So there's official charges lodged against Luther. A man named Albert of Mainz was the one who actually raised the charges. And Albert was making money from selling indulgences, just like Johann Tetzel. So he took it kind of personal. He didn't like the fact that Luther was criticizing the sale of indulgences. And so now we have official church charges drawn up against Luther. Initially, Pope Leo didn't really care. It seemed like a minor dispute. Luther was not a threat to the Roman church at this point. And so he didn't really take it too serious. He did assign a man named Gabriel Della Volta to end the dispute. And so a meeting is called in Heidelberg, Germany, in 1518. And at this meeting, Martin Luther presents 40 theses. <laughs> this guy loved theses. We talked about his 95 that he nailed to the church door. There's actually a set of 97 theses that he wrote before them that never really got much attention. And here he's at it again with 40 theses this time. So these guys love to, to write theses. So as Martin Luther is making his case at the Heidelberg Disputation, he basically says three things. The first thing he does is he defends Augustine's doctrines of sin and grace. So we're not going to cover Augustine in this class, or some of you have heard him referred to as Augustine, but he was a theologian who lived back in the 4th and 5th centuries, so we're going back almost over a thousand, or over a thousand years from Martin Luther. And Augustine is actually one of the most influential and well-known and well-read theologians in the whole history of the church. Among other things, what Augustine is famous for is faithfully proclaiming the biblical doctrines of human depravity and the absolute sovereignty of God in saving sinners. So at this dispute, Martin Luther makes it very clear that he agrees with Augustine. He believes in the spiritual deadness of men, and he believes in the absolute necessity of God's sovereign grace to freely save sinners. A little bit of a controversial point we'll see in a little bit. The second thing that Luther did at this dispute was he attacked any approach that tried to blend Christian theology and human philosophy. So in particular, he hated the approach of some theologians who went before him who tried to take Aristotle's philosophy and blend it with biblical revelation and try and merge the two systems together. Luther hated that because he said it really betrayed the message of the Bible. So he felt like the scriptures should be read on their own authority and in the light of their own revelation. It reminds me kind of what Apostle Paul says in uh, Colossians 2.8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So Luther felt like you can't take human philosophy, especially pagan philosophy, and just try and blend it with Christianity and make some sort of syncretized system. That just doesn't work because you end up destroying the message of the Bible when you do that. The third thing Luther did was he set out what he called the theology of the cross versus a theology of glory. Now, when you hear the phrase, a theology of glory, it probably sounds like a good thing to you. It did to me the first time I read it. Because the image that came to my mind was the glory of God, a theology that brings glory to God. But Luther actually meant it in a much more negative way. For him, a theology of glory was a theology that glorifies human achievement. So a theology that elevates the intellectual achievements of man or the moral achievements of men in trying to accomplish their own salvation. Contrast that with what Luther called a theology of the cross. For him, the theology of the cross was a rejection of human achievement. And Luther said that this rejection was most clearly seen in the crucified Lord Jesus. So here's a question for you, class. Why do you think that Martin Luther would describe the cross as a rejection of human achievement? In what way is the cross a rejection of that? Wayne? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so the cross is the ultimate demonstration of man's failure and, and Christ's perfection, right? Isn't the cross also a testimony to the fact that you cannot get right with God in your own effort? The cross is absolutely necessary for us to know God. So when Jesus is lifted up and crucified, the message is this. There's no other way for you to be saved. There's no good, righteous person among us who can attain a life of approval in God's sight. So the cross is a very clear testimony from heaven that God rejects human achievement. And in its place, he offers his son and his perfect work that was done for us. So Luther set out that contrast. We have a theology of glory versus a theology of the cross. And Luther said that if the sinner ever wants to receive the grace of Christ, he has to despair of his own intellectual abilities and his own moral abilities. So if you want to know God and you want to receive the grace of Christ, you have to give up on yourself. And you have to lift your eyes to the crucified Savior. This reminds me of what I've been preaching through in Corinthians. You guys remember a few weeks ago we had this portion in chapter 3 with the gold and silver and precious stones and then the wood and the hay and the stubble. If you just glance at that theology of glory, I think it's a prime example of the wood and hay and straw. Any theology that celebrates human achievement won't stand the test of God's fire. It won't stand the scrutiny of Judgment Day. But the theology of the cross is a great example of the gold and silver and precious stones that will stand the test of God's fire because it glorifies the work of Jesus. And it's not man-centered. It's not a celebration of human effort and human accomplishment. The second debate that we're going to look at took place in June and July of 1519 in the German city of Leipzig. So on one side of the debate, we have Martin Luther and two of his colleagues, Philip Melanchthon and Andreas Karlstadt. On the other side of the debate, we have a man named Johann Eck. Lots of Johans in, in this story. And Johann Eck was a professor. He was a Roman Catholic theologian, and he was an excellent debater. Some people say he was one of the greatest debaters of his day. The proceedings opened up, and you had Eck versus Karlstadt. Karlstadt was one of Luther's friends. And the initial discussion was about Augustine's doctrines of sin and grace. So once again, they were talking about the nature of sin, the nature of human depravity, the nature of salvation, how God's grace works. And Johann Eck, the Roman Catholic theologian, got the better of Karlstadt. He was a better thinker. He was a better debater. He was quicker on his feet. And so he won the opening rounds of the debate. But then Martin Luther stepped in. And things changed a little bit. A man named Peter Mussolinis was the chairman of the debate. So listen to this eyewitness testimony from the man who chaired the debate. Look how he describes Luther's presence. He says, Luther is of medium size, his body thin and so worn out by burdens of responsibility and study that you can, you can almost count all his bones. He's in the full maturity of his powers. His voice is clear and beautiful. His learning and his knowledge of scripture are so extraordinary that he can quote anything perfectly from memory. He understands Greek and Hebrew well enough to give his own judgment on what words and phrases mean. When he speaks, he has a rich store of subjects at his command and a huge forest of thoughts and words at his disposal. There's nothing lofty or proud about him. He knows how to adapt himself to different people and circumstances. He's always fresh, cheerful, and relaxed with a pleasant expression on his face, no matter how hard his enemies press him. You just cannot help believing that heaven is with him in his mighty labor. However, most people criticize him for not being moderate enough when he argues against his foes. He lacks prudence and is more cutting in speech than a theologian and reformer ought to be. Listen to this. During the debate, he carried a bunch of flowers in his hand, and whenever the argument became heated, he looked at his flowers and smelled them. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> Did you say the sinners are not dead? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Did you say synergism? <laughs> he literally held flowers in his hand. So it kind of gives you a little snapshot as to the, the man. He was not a perfect man, amen? If you read more about Luther, he was fiery. And I would say he often went too far 
in how he criticized his enemies. So he had deep convictions. He had a fire in his eyes, and sometimes, I think, he lacked a bridled tongue and a bridled pen. But here's a nice snapshot of somebody who was there that day and watched him dispute. So as the argument goes back and forth that day, Eck tried to get Luther to admit that his teachings were the same as John Huss. So if we go back to week two, Pastor Jeff talked about some of the pre-reformers. One of them was John Huss. And John Huss, who lived about 100 years before Luther, listen to some some of the things that John Huss taught. He taught that Christ is the only head of the church, not the Pope. Huss emphasized the authority of the Bible. And Huss wrote against the sale of indulgences. Sound a little familiar, doesn't it? So Huss, for his teachings about 100 years earlier, was arrested, imprisoned, condemned as a heretic by a church council, and burned alive at the stake. So here's the trap that Eck had set for Luther. He was exposing how Luther's beliefs were the same as a man who was already condemned as a heretic. So basically the idea was, hey, Martin Luther, you sound a lot like John Huss, the man who was burned under the authority of a church council for his teaching. Are you saying you agree with a heretic? Are you siding with a man who's been condemned for over 100 years? Well, this forced Luther to admit that church councils can make mistakes. Now, as I say that, no one here gasps. When I say church councils can make mistakes, nobody says, because we kind of just take that for granted. But if you go back to the 1500s, this is a revolutionary idea that Martin Luther is proclaiming. At the time, church councils are considered authoritative. And by many people, they're considered infallible. So in Roman Catholic theology, the church councils stand on the same level as Scripture. And so for Martin Luther to say that John Huss was burned by a church council, but that church council was wrong for doing it, was a bold position to take. Again, doesn't quite hit us the same, but in his day, he was really standing out by making that point. So... Here we have a very important Reformation theme on display, authority. This is one of the core issues of the Reformation. What authority does the church appeal to for its teaching and practice? Well, let's just track with Luther a little bit up to this point. He has already questioned the authority of the Pope. Actually, if you read at this time in in Luther's life, he kind of has this haunting fear in the back of his head that the Pope may be the Antichrist. So he's thinking to himself, I've been serving under the authority of a man who may himself be Antichrist, okay? He's questioned the authority of the Pope. Now, he has denied the infallibility of church councils. So what is this guy going to stand on? If the Pope's not infallible and can be criticized, if church councils can make mistakes and be criticized, then what do we have? We only, we only have the Bible, right? Right? This is where the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura is birthed. Scripture alone. The Latin label there is what we recognize it as today. Scripture alone. So Luther has been pushed by Eck to admit, yeah, I I disagree with the Pope. And yeah, I know John Huss was burned, but the church council shouldn't have done that. So here's my position. I only stand on what the scriptures teach. Scripture alone will be the sole infallible authority for the church. Now, how did Luther get that? How did he arrive at that conclusion? Well, he was brilliant in his own right. He was a great scholar. He studied, he prayed, he had some awesome personal experiences with God as he read the scriptures. But we need to give some credit to where credit is due because a lot of Martin Luther's theology was influenced by his dear friend, Philip Melanchthon. So Philip Melanchthon was a a mild-mannered man, and he was renowned for his brilliant intellect. He was a professor at Wittenberg University who taught logic, ethics, and exegesis. So this guy was no slouch. He was also an expert in the Greek language, which really played a prominent role in Luther's understanding of New Testament theology 
But on top of all this, Philip Melanchthon was Martin Luther's best friend. Don't these guys look like someone you'd want to hang out with on a Friday night? <laughs> they were wild and crazy, man. They were just off the hook. They looked like they'd have a blast, don't they? <laughs> just sit around and debate Greek words and what they mean all the time. Philip Melanchthon and Luther were really close, and they had a lifelong bond that they shared with each other as they ministered together. Listen to how Luther describes their relationship. He says, I'm rough, rowdy, and stormy, born to fight armies of devils and monsters. My job is to get rid of stumps and stones, hack away thistles and thorns, clear away wild forests. Then along comes Master Philip, gently and softly, sowing and watering with joy, according to the gifts that God has so amply granted him. So you can see a sharp contrast between these men and their personalities. Luther is the bush hog that's out there just mowing down the thick shrubs and the, and the brush. And then Melanchthon comes behind with a gentle spirit, and he sows the seed and waters the seed. They're very different men, but you can see how they come together to form a really effective combination. When, we're, when they're at Leipzig... Uh, Melanchthon, I don't, I don't know that this is supposed to be Melanchthon, I just kind of put a circle around somebody who was standing next to Luther, but Melanchthon was, a, <laughs> I just made that up because I thought, ah, he's probably standing right there, that's, that's close enough, okay? He's Luther's right hand man, right? So Melanchthon is basically on Luther's debate team. So you could kind of think of it like Melanchthon's the brains, Luther's the, the mouth. So Luther's up there with his stormy, passionate speech refuting Johann Eck, and then in between rounds, Melanchthon's kind of whispering, hey, you should say this. Hey, don't forget Romans says this. Hey, this Greek word actually means this. And so the two men worked together to kind of get this Reformation fire started. And it was actually Philip Melanchthon who first suggested the idea that the church fathers, the early church fathers, these are the uh, theologians who lived in the first few centuries after the apostles, Melanchthon said that the church father should be read in light of the Bible, not the other way around. So when you read something from a man who lived in the 100s or 200s, that shouldn't be the starting point that you use to judge scripture. Melanchthon said it's the other way around. We should criticize the church fathers in light of what the Bible says. You see, once again, this is, it's what we start with, and it's the authority that we stand on. So Melanchthon said, no, we don't start with what Justin Martyr wrote in the year 130 and then use that to judge the Bible. He said, we start with what the Apostle Paul wrote. And if anybody contradicts Scripture, then we criticize them. We don't try to change the meaning of what the Bible says. Now, I want to clarify something because I think this is really important. When we use the phrase sola scriptura, which we should, we might have this idea in our heads that we just read the Bible and everything else is bad. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, and somehow everything else is just like not worth touching. That's not what the Reformers had in mind. That is not what Philip Melanchthon meant. That's not what Martin Luther meant when they said Sola Scriptura. They actually had the idea in their head that we should have a critical reverence for church traditions and authors and authorities. The Bible's ultimate but that doesn't mean that everything else is worthless. So none of these guys suggested that you just read your Bible and burn all your commentaries and don't listen to any preaching and don't, don't ask anybody else for input. That's not what they meant when they said sola scriptura. It was just a very clear delineation about what's supreme and what's fallible. So for them, they believe that you should read other authors and you should study church history and you should be respectful towards church tradition but you shouldn't treat it as ultimate. You shouldn't treat it as sacred. So halfway through the dispute, it's not resolved, there's a new German emperor, there's, I'm sorry, there's a new emperor elected, Charles V. And basically both sides of the dispute say, I appeal to the emperor. We're going back and forth with each other. Well, I appeal to the new emperor to hear my calls. Does that ring a bell in anybody's mind? The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. I think there's a real strong parallel here between Paul and Martin Luther. You guys remember in the book of Acts, what happens with Paul? He starts preaching the gospel. People respond negatively, and they put him on trial. And when Paul's on trial, what is it? It's actually a platform to further preach the gospel. 
And so Paul has to stand before some Roman authorities and some Jewish authorities. And what does he eventually do? Paul eventually says, well, I appeal to Caesar, which got him a one-way ticket to Rome to preach the gospel face-to-face to Nero. Yeah, think about that. So I think there's some similarities here in, in Martin Luther's life. He is proclaiming faithful Bible teaching. He's put on trial for it. He has to defend his positions, and ultimately he appeals to the highest authority in the land. And so we have yet another meeting. These guys write theses, and they have meetings to debate things. That's kind of what they do. Typical Tuesday night in Germany in the 1500s. The Diet of Worms. Sounds really gross, doesn't it? I promise nobody ate any worms. That is not what we're talking about when we say the Diet of Worms. A diet was just another name for an imperial gathering, and Worms was the city that it took place in. So the Diet of Worms, or the meeting that took place in Worms. This is the big one. This is maybe one of the most prominent scenes in Martin Luther's life. It convenes in 1521, and the goal is to settle the dispute between Martin Luther and the Roman Catholic Church. So now the emperor is involved, and really Martin Luther's case is going to be heard in the highest court of the land. And we look back on it and say, praise God. Now he's got a chance to proclaim Reformation principles before the whole nation. By the time the Diet of Worms had met, Martin Luther had definitely severed all ties with Rome. So by the time we get here, he's not still respecting the Pope and maybe considering staying in the Roman Catholic Church. By the time we get to 1521, Martin Luther is done with Roman Catholicism. The lines are clearly drawn. He's on this side, they're on that side. And they're completely opposed to each other. What helped him make that decisive break? Well, believe it or not, he studied some of the writings of John Huss. And listen to what Martin Luther said about John Huss. We are all Hussites without knowing it. St. Paul and St. Augustine are Hussites. <laughs> that was just his way of saying John Huss got it right. So Johann Eck in the previous debate, when he said, you sound a lot like John Huss, at this point Martin Luther saying, yeah, I do, because John Huss got it right. He was saying what the Bible says, and I'm going to stand with him, and I'm going to agree with him. So the Pope and, and Luther are diametrically opposed to each other at this point. And the Pope has issued a papal decree that Luther must submit. He's got to stop teaching and defying Roman Catholic theology. He's got, I think it's 60 days to submit, or he's going to be officially labeled as a heretic. So what do you think Luther's response was when he's threatened by the Pope? Well, he announces to everybody in Wittenberg that he's going to burn the order publicly. So a bunch of students and citizens gather together on December 10th and watch as Martin Luther takes the decree from the Pope and burns it in, in the middle of the city. <laughs> Needless to say, he's not exactly going to respond positively to the Pope's threats. As the crowd is watching, they are cheering him on and they're throwing their own Roman Catholic books and works into the flames as well. So there's some momentum growing in this cause. Luther refused to submit, and that means this, his fate would be decided by the outcome of the Diet of Worms. So this meeting that takes place in Worms is going to decide what happens to Martin Luther. He knew that just attending the meeting was dangerous. He's already got the label of heretic hanging over his head. And so Martin Luther knows that just showing up could cost him his life. He said this, even if the emperor calls me to Worms in order to kill me or to declare me an enemy of the empire, I shall offer to come. With Christ helping me, I shall not run away, nor shall I abandon God's word in this struggle. He's ready to suffer for what he believes, and he's ready to die for it. It's a bit of a gut check for us, isn't it? He's ready to die for his convictions. So here, let's get into the meeting itself. I've got a, a, a quote from Nick Needham here. Luther arrived at Worms on the 16th of April. On the 17th, he appeared before the Diet. On a table before him lay a collection of his writings. An official of the Archbishop of Trier, surnamed Eck, he's debating another guy named Eck, but it's not the same Eck. I can't help myself. These guys are a real pain in the Eck. <laughs> Insert dad joke. That was a good one. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Uh, Eck comes to Luther and he points to all the writings on the table 
And he asks the German if the writings are his. Martin Luther, are these in fact your writings? Luther said yes. Eck asked him if he still defended them or if he would give up his heresies. Luther asked for time to think about it, and he was granted one day. The following afternoon, he appeared before the Diet again. Luther made a speech in German justifying what he had written and promised that if his opponents could prove he was mistaken from the scriptures, he would be the first one to throw his books into the fire. So if you can show me I'm wrong from the Bible, I will repent. If you can prove I'm wrong from scripture, then I will burn my works. Then he asked permission to repeat the speech in Latin. This was refused. Uh, Eck commanded Luther to give a straightforward answer to a simple question. Would he abandon his heretical views, which were nothing more than the long-condemned errors of Wycliffe and Huss? Pre-reformers, John Wycliffe and John Huss. This is your last chance, Luther. You're a heretic, just like John Wycliffe, just like John Huss. This is your last chance to repent. Luther replied with the most famous words in the history of Western Christianity. Unless I am refuted and convicted by testimonies of scripture or by clear reason, since I believe neither the popes nor the councils by themselves, for it is clear that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am conquered by the holy scriptures I've quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not withdraw anything since it is neither safe nor right to do anything against one's conscience. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. <laughs> this, this is like the big famous speech. So when you're talking about the famous speech from Martin Luther, it's not the I have a dream speech. Okay? It's this, this the here I stand speech. Martin Luther King Jr. was the I have a dream speech, just, just to be clear. After this speech, Luther walks out and he exits and he finds a crowd of cheering supporters and the council is standing there stunned. So it's kind of like a mic drop moment. He makes this speech and he walks out and the emperor dismisses the entire meeting and everybody's generally confused on what's going to happen next. Well, here's what happened next. The remaining delegates decided to condemn Martin Luther. They said, yes, this guy is in fact a heretic. And from this point forward, they put him under the ban of the empire. So that means that Martin Luther was to be executed if he was found, and anybody who sheltered him, anybody who helped him was committing a crime. Now, it's one thing to say nobody is allowed to help Martin Luther, but it's, a, it's another thing to actually enforce that law. Enforcing it was, was not, at this point, Luther had become a national hero. So there's lots of Germans who are like, Luther, Luther. Some of them agreed with his theology. Some of them just wanted to see Rome overthrown. Either way, Luther had a following at this point. There was also groups that joined the movement, the Waldensians, the Lollards, and the Hussites. Those are the pre-reformers we talked about. So the followers of Peter Waldo, the followers of John Wycliffe, and the followers of John Huss. Those movements survived up till this time, and they said, we're with Luther too. So now, it's illegal to shelter Luther. It's illegal to help him. But who's going to obey that law? You know, you can imagine if we're there living in that time, we're like, dude, we will do anything we can to protect this guy and help this guy because we believe that he's fighting God's cause. Something really interesting happens next. On Luther's way home from Worms to Wittenberg, he is intercepted by a group of knights. This sounds like I'm making it up, but I promise I'm not. There were no unicorns or dragons or anything, but a group of knights comes and they basically kidnap Luther. So he's on his way home from the council. He just made it known that he's an enemy of the Pope. He's officially an outlaw and a heretic. And he's probably thinking to himself, man, the next person that finds me is going to kill me or turn me in. And instead, it's a group of knights that abduct him. And they carry him away to Wartburg Castle, where they hide him and keep him safe. They were sent by uh, Frederick the Wise of Saxony, who was a German prince that favored Luther. So here's a providential turn abducted by knights, stowed away in a castle for 11 months, and instead of being harmed, he's actually kept safe. So praise God, Martin Luther lives to play another day. Here's a look at uh, Wartburg Castle in modern times. So it wasn't exactly the worst place to get abducted to. You know, he's, it looks like he was pretty comfy while he was there. While Luther is spending this year 
in his uh, confinement, if you will, he actually changes his appearance so that he'll be unrecognizable. He grows his hair out. He grows a beard. Most pictures you see of Martin Luther, he's clean shaven. He's one of the few reformers that doesn't have facial hair. But during this 11 months, he grows out his beard and he changed his friar's, uh, he get, got rid of his friar's gown and dressed in gentleman's clothes. So now he's got long hair, he's got a big beard, he's, he's changed his dress, and he starts calling himself Sir George. And this is really funny because during this 11 months, once he changed his appearance, he would go out in public and start talking to people, and he would ask them if anybody knew where Luther was. <laughs> so I love it. You know, hi, my name's Sir George. Any news on Luther? Have they found him yet? And he's just mixing it up in the marketplace. And uh, he's incognito. Talk about hiding in plain sight, right? I, I wish we had time to get into more details of this guy's life, his marriage, and some of the humor and some of the irony that he uh, thought and how he wrote, but, but we won't. Um, here's a look at Luther's room in the Wartburg, uh, Wartburg Castle. During his stay here, he spent a lot of his time translating the Bible. So he took the Greek New Testament and translated it into German. Why is that important? Well, up to this time, the German translations that they had were translated from a Latin New Testament. So they were translations of translations. Luther recognized the importance of going back to the original languages. So Luther didn't start with Latin and translate it into German. He went back to Greek and translated it into German. That's another theme you guys are going to see as we study the Reformation is they had a reverence for the original languages. They wanted to make sure that they understood Greek and Hebrew so they could faithfully handle the original languages that the scriptures were written in. So what's Luther's legacy? As we kind of come to the close here, what's his legacy? Here's a, another quote from Needham. A host of popular writers throughout Germany took up Luther's cause, writing countless tracts condemning the papacy and supporting Luther. All the chief agents of communication in Germany propagated Lutheranism. So that's where the Lutheran church comes from. That's where the idea of Lutheran theology comes from. This is Martin Luther. Printers, artists, students, preachers, lawyers, teachers in city schools and merchants who could travel about spread Lutheran ideas and books. Most of Germany was now in open revolt against the papacy, and the papacy seemed powerless to stop it. So now this has turned into a massive national movement. And now there are people calling themselves Lutherans, not because they believe that Martin Luther died for their sins or could save their souls, but because they wanted it to be known that they were not adhering to Rome. They were following Luther and his theology. One of the most revealing signs of what was happening in Germany took place in Luther's university in Wittenberg. At the same time that Luther began translating the New Testament in the Wartburg Castle, a book was published in Wittenberg by his fellow professor and closest friend, Philip Melanchthon, the illustrious young humanist. His book was called Chief Points of Theological Matters. This was the first Lutheran systematic theology. Melanchthon was to revise it continually, publishing five further editions and the book became the supreme textbook of theology in Lutheran universities. So now the things that Luther saw in scripture, he was organizing them into textbooks so they could teach in universities and spread these ideas. So it's not an isolated debate against one man who represents Rome, now it's being taught in universities. Now the common people are being exposed to these ideas. It also showed that the young humanists of Germany, personified in Melanchthon, were rallying to Luther's cause. The river of Renaissance learning was flowing into the sea of Reformation. It heralded the fact that the reformers, listen to this, we'll close here. The reformers were no longer just attacking Rome. They were starting to produce a positive theology of their own, logically arranged and clearly stated as a counterpart to Rome's teaching. The protest against Roman abuses was turning into the establishment of an alternate church. So week one, I said that we were going to trace the Reformation through several streams. We have barely scratched the surface of Martin Luther's life. But the big picture point that I have wanted to make is that this is now the beginning of an offshoot. This is now the beginning of Protest the, the Protestant church and Protestantism. So we have this stream of Lutheranism that we've kind of seen launched in Martin Luther's life. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to study some other streams. We're going to look at Ulrich Zwingli next week. 
who's actually the catalyst for the Reformed branch of the Reformation, which sounds really redundant, the Reformed branch of the Reformation. We'll explain that when we get there. And that'll take us to the Anabaptists, which is another stream that breaks off during the Reformation. So we're going to stop there with Martin Luther. If any of this has been interesting to you, if any of this has left you with questions, uh, I have some great resources I'd love to put in your hands. There's so much more meat on the bone to study on this subject, and uh, I hope it's just whet your appetite a little bit. I would encourage you, lean into it and, and, and pick up a book and study some church history. It will bless you. I promise you that. Thank you guys for your time. Dude, I'm sweating bullets, man. Is it hot in here? Yeah, it's work, dude.